This is great. I must say, this is my favorite part <laughs> when I get to see everybody. <laughs> oh, my. It's just so um, magnificent to just suddenly see each other, you know. Of course, I don't understand how it works, so maybe that makes it more magical for me. <laughs> I... <clears throat> Just getting the Facebook feed going over here. Three. Jesse, let me know when you yeah. want. Yeah, you can start whenever you're ready, Michelle. Okay. Yeah. Well, checking in with your uh, Zoom posture. <laughs> and uh, just notice how your attention can start to connect with the top of your head and just notice notice your posture very lightly just going down through your body posture feeling the connection of your sit bones on whatever you're sitting on your feet your hands so that you connect with the support of your body, the bones. The cells in your body. And noticing that you can make an intention to be kind or caring, tender with whatever appears during your sitting in your mind, body, heart. Often when we hear the word kindness or care, tenderness, there is a kind of possibility of relaxing a little more into our posture, a safety, feeling more protected. The question, what is attention? It's an important question as we start a sitting. And just notice that you can make space for the awareness or attention to go wherever it's naturally drawn as a baseline. Notice if the attention lands for a while or shifts quickly from one sound or body sensation thought to another.
And notice if the attention itself is sticky, tight, chained to anything, or if you notice there's a kind of flexibility and just ease with a kind of ability not to be possessive, so possessive or identified with what appears. So, so beginning with that sense of everything that appears is like a, a cloud passing through the sky. We don't have to have a sense that the, we possess the thoughts or possess our body in a way that it becomes a prison for us emotions. And having that deep understanding that experience itself can't yield a permanent satisfaction that we're kind of waiting for settling back and knowing that each moment is valuable, it's life, life itself. Not to have this idea that one experience is better than another. So we, we have again that ability to allow, have space for boredom, or happiness, joy, sorrow, unpleasant, pleasant, neutral. With great compassion, with great care, allowing, ease, Dropping the attention a little bit more into the non-conceptual, if you can. For example, receiving sounds just as they're happening. Vibration texture. Noticing them change, disappear. Noticing any thoughts about the sounds. If you can. Without possessiveness. Finding that ease of not identifying with them. The body sensations, our whole body, we can relate to the body sensations just like sound. A symphony, vast universe of aliveness. Just like weather, maps, 
thermal, warm, cool, hot, cold, pressure, tightness, light vibration, tingling. Hard, rough, smooth, soft. Flowing, stuck. Ever changing. Sometimes shifting into that, allowing that emerging of whatever's appearing wordlessly, gently, tenderly. Whether it's fear, a sound, body sensation. Sleepiness, it's worthy, so worthy of our attention. A word can never describe sleepiness. Can we be interested in this weather front that comes in, in our bodies, mind, heart? Sometimes if we can, shifting to that, from receiving to the quiet, abiding with. Never again this moment.
if you um, can and want to just bring your attention to your hands. Notice the sensations there. Place them on your belly, abdomen. And just receive the life of your breath. Let it come all the way up into your hands, the, the sensations of this movement. This is something we all share together, all beings. Whether it's deep or shallow, vague or clear. Tight or soft. Hard, smooth. Disappearing particles. Seeing if you can care about this life of the breath we depend on so deeply. Care and accept that it comes and goes by itself. Finding the ease and peace that's there. That we all share. Thank you, Michelle. That was a nice bell ringing. Just want to take a quick look at everyone over here. Mm. Great. Um, <clears throat> so I thought I'd just offer a little reflection today uh, from something I've been reading. Uh, I've been reading um, a collection of writings and speeches, works from um, a man named Amilcar Cabral, who was a um, revolutionary, uh, 
anti-colonial organizer and what's now uh, Guinea-Bissau, then they would call it uh, Portuguese Guinea, I think. Um, really an amazing person, it seems like, you know, the more I read his work and, and some of the sort of stuff about his life, just very, um, of course, kind of driven, single-minded, but, but uh, one gets the sense, or I'm get, I get the sense that there's, he still really held on to his humanity a lot through this process, his kindness, his care for people. Um, sometimes people in those roles can lose that um, in their drive. You talk about uh, things like, you know, the, the need for unity, you know, amongst his, uh, the people in his country in this effort. And you talk about it as if he said, you know, if, oh, 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 you come upon uh, a woman with a huge basket on her head, you know, you know that it's full of fruit and she's headed to the market. And, um, you know, you look inside the basket and there's papayas and there's bananas and there's guavas and there's mangoes. There's a whole diversity of fruit, but it's still in the same basket. It's all unified for this purpose. Um, metaphors like that, that I think are very kind of joyous, still very beautiful. And meaningful, you know, this question of does unity mean that we have to lose all of our independent qualities? Or is there a way to have unification with also aliveness and diversity? It reminds me a lot of how I think we relate to the questions of concentration and mindfulness, the relationship between those things. But this talk is not about that metaphor. It's about cooking rice. Um, he says in it somewhere, he's talking about why why they decided to engage in this effort. And he says, you look at the world and there's all kinds of problems. There's all, you know, anywhere you look, there's suffering, there's injustice, but we have a, a phrase, a saying in Guinea, the um, rice doesn't cook outside the pot, right? You cook rice inside the pot so that we start with ourselves. We start with our own communities, our own uh, places and, and do that work there. And I think it's a, a very beautiful, uh, again, kind of image metaphor it really struck me. And I, I often actually think about our meditation practice as like cooking rice. Um, and so it felt like a, just that reminder, I think, for me in these times, how important that, that metaphor is, how, um, you know, we are living in times where there is we see so much hardship in the world around us. We see um, places where we want to put our energy. And it's not to say that those are wrong or invalid, but to remember the, um, the primary need um, of maintaining our own practice, our own connection to our own goodness, to, to be cooking rice inside the pot, uh, not just sort of trying to attend to everything out there so that we have our own nourishment, so that we have nourishment that can feed others, that can feed the goodness of others, the goodness of work in the world. How important actually this kind of metaphor is. And I, I think it is important too to, to even before we get into the that question of of <clears throat> you know what is what is this pot what is the metaphor of of the pot in which we're cooking the rice and what does this process look like to to know that of course there are external factors right that the rice might cook inside the pot but the fire is outside the pot right the intensity the 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 activating forces often can be outside of us right. Of, of what is motivating us, what is driving our, um, our meditation practice, our, 
uh, impulses towards the cultivation of goodness, the purification of our own hearts. We really, of course, recognize there's pain in the world. There's anguish, there's injustice, there is a lot of fire, right? Literally, metaphorically. There's hardship uh, just interpersonally in our lives, right? The people we know, our families, our friends, our communities. There's tension, there's, there's burning, there's conflict, right? There's, um, we recognize that, right? It's like, oh, we wanna make the world a better place, but it's so hard to even, uh, you know, make our families sane. <laughs> it's so hard to even have our workplaces feel like they're safe or supportive of the conditions that we want, the communities we live in. And then, of course, the, the fire in our own hearts, our own minds, the anguish of addiction, you know, of hatred, of confusion, of longing, of worry, of restlessness, anxiety, you know, there's these fires in our own minds, our own bodies. The Buddha would speak of this, you know, the world is on fire. How do we orient towards that? How do we make use of this fire? How do we not turn away from it? How do we not stoke it? How do we use the intensity of that, the heat of that uh, to purify the mind, heart, to cultivate the beautiful qualities? And so we recognize, right, that we don't just throw the rice on the fire. That isn't the process. And yet, we might get that metaphorically, but how are we really living our lives? How are we really engaging the people around us? How are we really engaging the world? A lot of times it actually might feel like that. We're just putting all of our energy into just more combustion, right? Adding fuel to the fire, burning, turning to ash, you know, that would, our, our own minds, our own hearts, that which would otherwise maybe nourish us nourish others, right? The fuel, the sustenance that we have, where does it become a force for nourishment, for goodness, for care, for connection? Where does it just fuel the fires? Where does it get burnt? Where do we burn ourselves up in this response? And so this idea that no, you, we have to have some container, some uh, pot, you know, some, some kind of, um, vehicle to gather what would other, the the potential nourishment to put it on these flames to receive the fire but in a way that disperses the heat disperses the intensity but also contains it right this sort of very actually very powerful um, role that the pot plays in cooking right, kind of channels, directs the attention uh, the, of the heat, the force, the, the cooking element, but also disperses it, makes it less, um, uh, more manageable, right? Can, it can bring utility to it. And this idea of our practice as being the pot in which we're cooking the rice, right? In which we're purifying the heart and mind, in which we're developing and cultivating these beautiful qualities, it's, it's so important. You know, where are we developing and committing to the seclusion of our practice every day, right? Where do we recognize that this process requires a container, right? We can't just be putting ourselves in the flames all the time, that we need the seclusion of practice, the container of that seclusion to be able to deal with the intensity, right? To gather the voltage the fire, the heat, the intensity of the flames, inner and outer, to be able to gather that energy, gather that attention in a way that is actually fruitful, that's bearing fruit, that's not burning us, not burning the world. It's hard, you know, I know that all of us are here, we, we have some 
inkling towards this, right? We, this this sense that it takes practice. That we 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 love our meditation practice. You know, most people who are here, and yet uh, there's an ambivalence every day for most people also in actually doing it. You know, actually carving out the time, actually creating that protective container of the pot. You know, you don't really want to cook. You know, that I think sometimes we can think of like, oh, there's this idea that meditation, it's all just like self care, you know, and it's one of these like good things you do for yourself that feels good, but we know it doesn't feel good a lot of the time, right? It's like you're cooking, <laughs> you know, it's like it's intense. This is heat, it's dark, you're cooking. It's like, oh, you'd rather just be like doing other stuff, you know, but there's that renunciation quality, right? This isn't just like, oh, not doing the things you don't want to do, but it's also not doing the things you do want to do, right? The sense of where are you creating the boundary of this container for some period of time every day, whether it's, you know, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour, more than that, that it takes a boundary. It takes saying no, and it takes saying no to forces that would otherwise be compelling us to do things that we don't want to do, but also it says, it takes saying no to ourselves of the things we would rather be doing. And uh, that might also bring more joy and more pleasure in the moment, right? There is that sense of renunciation, of seclusion of like, okay, no, we're gonna do this. We're gonna take the time to cook, to sit there in the heat of whatever we've cultivated in the heart and mind and body since the last time we sat willing to sit in the fire or not. You know, if you're an experienced yogi, yeah, for at some point, you, once you finally sit down, you know, there will be that sense of like, okay, you know, relief, the sense of why you're doing this. It doesn't make it easy. It doesn't mean that which arises is going to be pleasant or easy to work with, but we get reminded of why we do it. Right, this reminder, very innate, intuitive. You don't need to be reminded intellectually or metaphorically even, right? That, oh, right, the, we cook the rice inside the pot. And sit here, simmering with all the jumble, all that's in there. How important when we're sitting, the this dance between concentration and mindfulness. Where do we firm up the pot, right? Create a little bit of sense of like, oh, we're not just gonna go everywhere with the attention. We're gonna contain the awareness a little bit in some direction, right? To make it manageable, to be able to channel the intensity of awareness, of mental experience, to be able to observe in a way that feels fruitful, feels productive, not just sitting and thinking about whatever we think about. It's so important to remember that this is hard you know there's a reason why we avoid it there's a reason why we don't always want to do our practice every day why it takes commitment determination some diligence you know some discipline these sort of intense words but you sit in the fire and you you see why but it's also why we we don't just cook rice in a pot over the fire right that you need water you need something cooling. You need something that disperses the heat even more. That's refreshing. That's rejuvenating. You know, many of you have heard stories about Saida Upandita, or maybe you've sat with him. Stephen and Michelle's teacher for many years. One of the things he would tell yogis frequently, apparently, was he'd remind them that, you know, in Burma, we cook pork in its own fat. That was his metaphor for Vipassana practice. 
and so you know that's a little bit of a, a little more intense kind of metaphor than maybe rice cooking but even uh you know my grandmother she was from ecuador they would cook pork in its own fat also but you would always add water right chop it up and you actually needed to add a ton of water to it to get it going you know to boil it down to soften it to cool it down so that it wouldn't burn if you just and maybe say it uh, wasn't a trained cook either i don't know really how they do it in burma chances are if you just throw the pork into the pan it's going to burn <laughs> you actually need this other agent you know to to slow the process down to make it um to, to make the heat able to penetrate you know, in a different way. So similarly with, with rice, you're cooking and you need, you need water, you know, you need more water than rice. Not so much more, you know, the, my grandmother always, it's like a, if you're gonna do a cup of rice, you want like a cup and a half of water. Some people do two cups of water. It's too much water. You can do that with your practice. <laughs> <laughs> you think it's all just love and love and love and it's like it is love it is love we need that but it needs to be balanced right with the heat with the cooking in um in mexico i know they they fry it first they'll fry the rice first and then put the water in japan my understanding is they really soak the rice for a long time before you turn the heat on. You know, the sense of uh, my, my abuela, she would, you know, put it, the rice in the water and you, or you cook, you boil the water first really hot. And then once it's boiled, you throw the rice in, salt, oil, and then you turn it down to a very low simmer. And that seems to be true for, you know, most, roast rice cooking traditions. There's times of like intense heat, uh, but those are usually short times. Mostly you need this like a slow simmer, right? This sort of the slow, low intensity, but cooking, you know, cooking, but not burning, not scalding, not hurting yourself with your practice. The sense of like, yeah, it takes energy to, okay, the discipline and the, okay, you're gonna sit, you sit down on the cushion, you're trying to bring the attention to something. And yes, we all know it takes energy, it takes some vigor, it takes some force, some, um, some willpower to get that going. But that most of the time, actually, it's like once that's going, it's like, okay, you slow down. You're very careful about the voltage, about the intensity, the fire that you're bringing to it. You actually wanna simmer in your practice, keep it gentle, keep it cool, keep it warm, you have this balance, you know, not too hot, but it's like the water has to really penetrate the rice and cook it slowly. And then almost all these traditions also, you have to, once it's done, once you simmer, you, you let it rest, you know, you let it, you, you turn off the heat. You just let it kind of hang out and radiate. So that also in our practice, a sense of, okay, maybe there's some more intense heat, but a long time of just simmering. And then a long time of just resting these places in our practice where you don't need to add intensity. You don't need to add heat. You don't need to add anything where you really feel like, oh, the mindfulness is there. The concentration is there. The equanimity is there. The loving kindness is there. These places where we can get to where it really feels like the attention is in balance. We're not forcing. We're not needing to make anything happen. There's just this abiding in the heat and the process that's been generating. It's so powerful, this process. The Buddha himself, I think maybe Steve was telling the story recently. You know, it went for on his ambitiousness to get liberated, you know, spent many years 
doing very extreme practices of, um, you know, incredible restraint of the mind and body, and even to the degree of, you know, standing in very difficult postures for very long periods of time and starving himself. They said he would eat one grain of rice a day. You know, these extreme, the sense that you had to crush the mind and crush the body to get liberated was part of a common practice and understanding and viewpoint and way of practicing in that time. And he talked about how he would go through the most extremes of all of these things and found that it didn't ever, you know, he could develop incredible concentration, but never really created that restfulness of mind. Never really, it never led to the liberation of the heart that he knew was possible. And one time out of just exhaustion and despair, this um, young woman found him depleted and you know almost dead skeletal and she would bring her uh, some rice porridge as an offering to the spirits on the altar and in her area every day and so instead she decided to give this rice gruel offering to the buddha and he accepted it and slowly began to gather his strength again right this her generosity was nourishment to him the food was nourishment to him in balance. We developed this understanding of the middle way, of not needing these extremes of extreme indulgence or uh, extreme asceticism. This rice porridge has a very powerful literal and symbolic meaning in our lineage, our practice. And understanding, you know, we, it's like we have to cook the rice every day. If we're going to give people this nourishment from our own hearts and minds, if we're going to be able to nourish ourselves, we have to keep making it. We have to keep producing it. And there's no, I know many, many of us don't cook every day anymore, right? Even COVID times now, some people are cooking more, some people take out more. You can't take out this rice, you have to cook it. There's no other way, you know. And this sense of like, oh, wow, you know, the more rice you cook, the more you can feed yourself, the more you can feed others. How beautiful that is. Think about there's so many fires in this world right now. How much rice you can cook with all those fires the most nourishment you can provide for yourself and others if we take the time to make use of that fire in a way that doesn't just burn ourselves and burn others and create and fan the flames, but actually find ways of, of nourishing, right? Of, of sitting in the fire, of not running from it, not needing to put it out, but of using that using the intensity of reality, of life, of our own lives, of the lives and the people we interact with, the, the larger world, can we use all of that intensity to develop our own care, our own wisdom, our understanding of what is the mind, what is the body? How do we find our connection to love, to compassion, to appreciation, to equanimity? in these intense conditions. When we find our way back to those qualities of heart, how do we see that they're not personal, right? That we see like, oh, we can help others find their way back to those. There's no difference between someone else's fear and our fear, someone else's anger and our anger. We can use all of the heat, all of the fire right, to cook more nourishment for ourselves and others. But we have to practice. We have to do it. We have to actually sit down in our chair, on our cushion every day, do our walking meditation, do our sitting meditation, have some sense of the container for our minds needs to be upheld, needs to be secured, needs to be developed. 
every day. Otherwise, we lose the ability to make use of the fire, to make use of these volatile conditions. And so it's like, where do we find the goodness of our motivation to practice? Sometimes it's not easy, but there are times where if you realize, you remember this is good for you, it's good for the world, we're making use of the hardship of our lives, of those around us, of those in the world, and taking responsibility. And that the rice gets cooked inside the pot, not outside the pot. And feed ourselves with that goodness, feed the world with what we generate. So I think that's it for now. And um, Michelle and I will take a, a little time today for um, questions, if anybody has any about uh, your practice, about the talk, about the instructions, whatever might be really supportive. We know it's, a, it's an intense time, it's a powerful time, and we wanna make sure that everyone has the, the tools they need the pot you need to to cook your rice in a good way. So Michelle, I'll, I'll, you can unmute there. And uh, if anyone has a question, you can um, go to your the little side there on the right. If you click on the participants, there should be a little button uh, under more to raise your blue hand. We're happy to take any questions you might have. It is really great to see folks. We, first of all, we don't need to take questions anyway, so we don't need to, we won't wait all afternoon, but it is amazing. One thing I noticed, you know, we just had this um, 10 day retreat, online retreat last week, and it's wonderful to see a bunch of those folks here again. And it's really new, you know, there's that, I think in the back when people used to travel and go to retreats, <laughs> we would see people, you know, for 10 days and then maybe see them the next year, you know, maybe if everything worked out. And so this has really been amazing to actually have this kind of sustained sense of connection. Um, and some people going on more intensive periods and others not and kind of this, this rhythm of the Sundays is really wonderful. Maybe they all want your grandmother's recipe for rice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a little tricky because now actually I do use a Japanese like style pot, <laughs> donabe I think they're called. And so it's like got a double lid and uh, it does make better rice, but I don't do it in the Japanese style. I do it in my grandmother's style. <laughs> so it's like a little bit hard to convey that transmission, you know, someday. <laughs> hmm.
Hmm. Well, everybody's fine. Everybody's hmm. coping with the world and life just fine, it seems. <laughs> um, that's great. Hmm. Oh. Oh. oh, all right, here we go. There is a question. Vanessa, are you there? Yes. yes. Hi. Oh, I think you just unmuted yourself again. Hold on. Can you unmute? There we go. Yep. Ow. Hi. 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 I. I guess my. I. I don't really have a question. I just. Um, I think your talk um, was excellent. Um, I just can't. I can't let it pass that. That we're all fine. <laughs> because I'm not. I mean, I am. I am fine. I am absolutely fine. In many ways, I'm blessed. Um, but the the state of the world and the beings in it is just so uncomfortable right now. I I feel. Um, and perhaps others share this with me. We're sort of like uh, the Australians say, gobsmacked. You know. I mean, what is there to say? What is there to say? Because it's just so um, disturbing what's happening in the world in every respect. And um, I don't know about everybody else, but I'm paralyzed by it. So I just have to sort of focus on the flowers in my garden. And I'm lucky to have flowers in my garden to focus on. And, I, and uh, go for walks and Zoom with my grandchildren who are down there in the States. I'm in Toronto. I don't know when I'll see them again in real life, but uh, thank God for Zoom. So I just really didn't, I don't have a question because all we can do is practice, but I just sort of wanted to share that sense of paralysis almost. And with winter coming, um, and our numbers up here in Toronto are not as bad as down in the States, but they're rising rapidly at the moment in Toronto. And it just feels such a, a weight to wait. So I'm just fortunate that I can zoom around the world and and uh, there's so much to being offered out there in terms of Dharma and uh, it's um, I'm very grateful for that. Mm -hmm. I really yeah. don't have a question. No, <laughs> that's a, thank you. I think it's important to voice because I think that it does feel like it's more that kind of silence, <laughs> you know, for for many folks. It's it's um, and that and I think there's something actually really powerful that practice can do around like we all know we we have said and thought the same things about our our take on everything, right? Of politics and how COVID. It's like we all know what we think about all of it. And there's some degree to which it's like, it's good to have our analysis and to know and to read and to be involved and trying to help. And there is something I think sometimes after sitting where you just know that you can just, just to sit in it, to sit in the confusion or paralysis or pain or whatever, whatever, however you would name it or not even name it, that there is something very powerful actually about just being in it. And um, sometimes it is important to name. So thank you for that. And um, yeah, it is it is quite a time. Yeah. I I, I do want to just also thank you. I think um, that silence that. Um, was happening was actually full. It was uh, important. The silence was important, but also I, I kind of teased everybody a little bit like, okay, <laughs> is everyone fine? Because I know, you know, I know we all know what you said is true. And it's, it's, uh, I have an 82 year old uh, woman who was a neighbor from my childhood. 
um, that I think she texted me yesterday that uh, I need to seek solace every day now. And, and I think that's what you said, you know, that, that you're finding ways to find refuge and solace and beauty and I, uh, I, as a response to the paralysis, I think that uh, I have other people who will you know, write me and say they have felt frozen since the pandemic started you know, just like frozen in time. Uh, you know, people have very, but the word paralysis, right, frozen, just, um, or I think sometimes I feel like my blood boils in response to the suffering, the unnecessary, there's so much unnecessary suffering going on. Um, so I, you know, we, we, are here now every Sunday as a way to kind of come together, hold, hold us. That's the rice pot, right? The, the, to, the container to um, keep practicing, particularly, I think we all need so much compassion and equanimity. It's just those two wings of the bird. We need, we need caring about the pain. That pleasant feeling of caring about the pain is like going to see a beautiful flower. You know, that beautiful quality of mind that can care about pain inwardly and outwardly and the equanimity where there's that deep um, understanding of karma. So we're all living this karma together uh, we're living karma out together and we really need um, to create, keep creating refuge inwardly and outwardly. And I feel, I feel us all doing that, you know, the, that that's the, uh, the times we're in is calling forth deeper and deeper practice from us. <laughs> We'll just take one more, maybe, then from Molly here. Are you there? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, the retreat was so perfectly powerful um, for me to have that kind of sustained 10 days of um, feeling the teachings and the connection with everyone. And generally in my life i don't go to guided meditations when i'm not in retreat i sit on my own and um i have been really wanting <laughs> more of your voices like in the morning i'll I, i've kept the 5 a.m wake up and i want darine <laughs> like i want <laughs> i want that sense of getting up and crawling into the warmth of the connectedness. So I'm really grateful for the flight um, chance because it's so, it, it, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, immediate now. I can still get it from that. Um, it's just been so wonderful. Mm. Um, I, I, I am called to sit on my own and see what happens with all the instruction that's been given and see how to allow awareness to go where it will. And as you, you said one thing today that was like, oh, thank you. The, the idea of like how much concentration, how much letting the mind go where it will and not wanting to get too busy with it. Um, I'm so grateful for the guidance because I don't have to be that person um, doing that. Anyway, that's, that's where my practice is at right now. I'm still doing multiple long sittings in a day as I go into the, the world. And I don't think I'm going to be able to continue that forever and ever, but maybe. Um, but right now the issue is how much training wheels 
after a retreat and how much is it okay to keep using the resources? <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's great. Michelle, do you want to start or? No? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I just think that sense of like, you know, you're thirsty for it and it's work, it works and you're sitting, you know, multiple times a day and it's like with that, you know, I wouldn't second guess it. You know, it's like, we get it. That's why we're trying to record more and have more available. And, you know, it's like just to understand that it can be of a support. So it's like, I think the last thing anyone really needs right now is like more judgment about like the fine tuning of their practice or whatever, you know, it's like, do it, do it works, you know, do what helps. Um, and I think in some ways, I, you know, I, this is more like a very practical thing of just like, how do we consolidate our offerings a little more? It's a little hard, you know, we have stuff on the website, there's like the YouTube channel, then there's like a lot of talks and instructions and stuff are like on Dharma Seed, then there's Insight Timer, or I have some stuff. It's like, it's a little bit kind of like around, and of course there's plenty of other stuff that is outside of, you know, the our team. So, I mean, that's a good part, as Vanessa was saying, it's like, there's so much available right now. Yeah. Um, but I also know that there is like that sense of like the coherence and even lo something live and like this is different than just listening to recordings also. And, you know, yeah, that we're all, you know, try doing our best in terms of sort of like keeping, keeping what we can offer, uh, you know, as much as possible. And, 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 and it has been important for us to see people are actually using it. People are watching, people are listening, people are using that material that's been recorded. And so, you know, it's great. It's like, use it and, you know, get, we need, we need whatever we need to get us it, it, to support our practice right now. It's like, oh my God, use it, use it, use it, you know? So I just think it's, it's wonderful. And I think, you know, yeah, who knows about the future, but go with the, go with the time and energy and space you have right now, if it's there and you can make use of it, you know, you don't want to do anything that's going to, undermine the momentum you have in your practice yeah it's really cool it's great thank you yeah mm. oh you're muted michelle i i would just add that um you know jesse mentioned all the things so i don't need to mention them and um in my lifetime so far, I've, I just want to kind of um, you know, agree with Jesse, but kind of even encourage you to go with your go with where the energy is. You know that because I've seen people who they they do think, oh, I don't need that or it's not, a, you know, or getting called to do a re retreat now, online retreat, and uh, maybe they've done one and they feel the need to do another one, but um, hold back. But what I've seen is that when you have the energy to do it, if you can do it, <laughs> it's just the way it is. Because, you know, a year from now, you might not have the energy to do it, right? And so that the kind of, way that I always try to guide myself, sorry, <coughs> and others, is if you can, and you're called to sit, daily practice or retreats, um, if it's not harmful to anybody, uh, please go for it. Because that doesn't always last, you know, it's like, I've done this since I was young, you know, and then then maybe I have to work for two years, right? When I first started practicing, but then I would plan and go when I felt it, go when I felt it, go when I felt it. That, that's just the kind of bottom line. Mm. And uh, sorry. <coughs> the other thing is you can bring in little ways to um, have a lightness I mean, I've mentioned this before, but it's, it's pretty funny. Like I have this feral cat that um, around 10 at night before I go to bed, I do the refuges with her. Oh. Yeah, but it's, it's like, this might sound funny, but she really looks forward to it. And um, I've never 
even picked her up after 10 years. But I give her a hug with each refuge. So we mm -hmm. take refuge in the Buddha and she gets a little hug. We take refuge in the Dhamma. <laughs> but that's like such a deep practice for me now. You know, it, does, it really doesn't matter that I do it with her particularly, but I know it has a power for her. But it's a, it's a discipline. Right, we use the word discipline, but it's a very powerful discipline for me. And there was a certain point where we did the metta chant. And so I, you know, I was called to do the metta chant. We did the metta chant, and I, you see, I, I did that, and then sometimes it'll switch to the refuges, but um, it doesn't always have to be a sitting. Sometimes listening to the metta chant before you go to sleep, for example. I'm just suggesting little things that can be a, a source of um, routine, mm -hmm. just like brushing your teeth or brush, you know, whatever. It, it's, uh, it's a powerful support that we often lose. We might do it in retreat. I've just seen it because I've done a lot of self-retreats and um, certain... I don't like to think of them as necessarily uh, fixed habits, but definitely things in the day that, um, you know, it's sunset, ringing the bell. Mm, I like that. You know, right? It's like there's just, uh, they're not long, but I, I, I don't let, I don't not do them. Even if I don't want to do it, I do it. It's and it's small enough that it's not that big of a hassle if I don't, right? And it's, it's very powerful. So I would suggest, I'm not saying do the things that I'm saying, but certainly you can bring these in in a very light but powerful way to, to also be a support for your practice. Mm. That's nice. Do you do the precepts with the cat? Well, um, for a feral cat to do... Uh, no killing is a little hard, but that's why we did the meta chant for so long. We did the, you know, she did the meta chant for a long time, and she understands. She tries really hard, you know, not to kill. She does, but sometimes you see her eye, uh, the pupil gets a little big, and um, you know, we we she's well fed. She doesn't need much. I don't see her do it that often. But that precepts a little, it's a challenging one for her. <laughs> but yes, she does the precepts. <laughs> yeah, not, not, um, not telling lies is really easy for her. I wonder about Acharya. <laughs> Simple, no problem. Yeah, all the others are easy for her, yeah. Um, Michelle, do you think we have time for another question? Yeah, just we one have more there? and then okay. we'll stop. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, Zoe, are you there? Oh, okay. yeah. So this is just going back to, can you hear me? You were talking about earlier and about, you said living, living out our karma. And I was wondering if you could just say more about that and how to be in these times. I mean, when you asked the question, are we all happy and settled? Friday was felt really dark um, after you know, getting the news of um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death and what that might mean for our country going forward. So anything yeah. you can say to inspire Hmm. Michelle, you started. You said the. I, I think the we, karma thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, the hard part about teaching about equanimity in um, the Brahma Vihara sense is that uh, kamasaka is the traditional phrase that comes with equanimity. Uh, that. Um, 
there's a there's like a collective karma happening and then there's an individual karma that happens and so an example i can give is when sayada upandita visited the big island and the volcano went off and it hadn't been gone off for a very long time um, at the end of the retreat someone asked him whose um, whose karma is it that the volcano went off and it was such an interesting question and he didn't even there wasn't even one second before he said um, it's all of our karma here on the island right now like and he he just he said it's all of our karma that that the volcano went off and it pele he called pele the goddess of fire i mean he didn't have any sense that she wasn't real or didn't exist he called her pele devi Devi, Deva, Pele, Devi, Pele, Devi. It's Pele. There's often the understanding that maybe it's just Pele's karma, right? But it's it's all of our karma. But he included, of course, Pele, Devi. But all of us at this moment in time, as it's going off, it's and as it continues, it's everybody's karma, whether it's bugs or trees or you know, it's all of the that movement of life at that time. So coming to peace, true equanimity, that without conditions, unconditional acceptance, um, when we offer the phrase, things are as they are, things are just as they are, um, the deeper meaning of that is that, you know, things are just as they are, but there's a um, understanding with that equanimity, upeka, uh, that what's appearing in this moment is our karma unfolding. Um, so, so really, in other words, um, you take responsibility for taking birth at this time. You know, that we all, we all share this responsibility, which I find supportive, not negative, but we all those of us that are trying to get, um, you know, be as kind and aware and awake and liberated and all that through this time, um, there's a certain karma to that. You know, it's like, um, and there's a certain karma for those who aren't interested in um, spiritual growth for example that's a, that's a karma that you you work with too it's like all of us together and then individually i thought it was a quite a quite an amazing day that ruth decided to go mm -hmm. what a the the jewish new year i mean it was an amazing day to I mean, Jesse, I'm sure you have more to say about it, but I think it's very important to understand that, you know, the deeper the Buddha taught that um, things are just as they are and things are coming and going by themselves and that there's that peace in that, but we also have to understand that whatever we're living out in the moment is, is a kind of fruit, a fruit from past action that could be from 400 years ago or two seconds ago. And, and for if you understand that, there's more of a sense of being able to work with it. It's like, okay, I take responsibility for what's appearing right now and do my best to bring as much wisdom and love to this experience um, so that uh, one is creating less karma. <laughs> That's the idea. Mm -hmm. So, like, less getting perturbed about not getting so perturbed about what's happening and the ups and that, and more just focusing on how one is in it and what one can do within the changing um, fortunes of what's happening and the suffering, but just more focusing on how one can be within it rather than getting perturbed about what is happening. Is that part of what you're saying? I think it's a nuanced 
response to like Tuca in the world that I, I think it's, I think it would be ungenuine or disingenuine, disingenuous of us to say like, don't get upset about all these horrible things happening. Like I, you know, there might be a way of interpreting like kind of classical Dhamma that, w that could be languaged in that way, right? Of like, the other, the, the way that I think the comma, the question of comma, karma relates to it is important, which is to say that like, of course this is happening, right? It's like, it's not to say don't get upset about it, but it's like, don't be confused about why there's violence right now in the world, right? And like, and we have to also have to be careful of like, what's the sort of like technical Buddhist stuff and what's the sort of like mystical stuff and what's more just like historiographic stuff right? where it's like, if you think that like the country has reckoned with its history of slavery, it's like, that's silly, of course not. Like it hasn't. In fact, it's like keeps pushing the can down the road or evading or avoiding. And so like, of course there's like continual volatility and oppression and response to that oppression that that occurs in our society because there has not been a reckoning with the harmful harmful results of those actions over centuries right and so the question of do we run do we take responsibility whatever that means collectively do we take it's that ownership of action like of course there's dukkha of course if like if that happened then this is what's happening now right when malcolm x says like oh it's america's chickens coming home to roost that's this that's like of course there's this of course there's this so you think you can topple governments and do all these things and like it's never gonna like come back to haunt us like no of course and we live with that toxicity culturally and so the idea of like not running from that but also not the hardship that we know just on the experiential level of like not responding to unpleasant with more aversion, not responding to pleasant with more addiction is very difficult. It's very difficult for ourselves in perfect conditions sitting wherever we may be sitting if we ever get quote unquote perfect conditions, never mind in the imperfect conditions between people where all of you know the, the wildness of that is out of our control so it's like the sense of like yeah well where do we have social processes and collective processes that are trying to do some of that on a more collective level right of not running from pain but trying to attend to it in a way that doesn't create more of it but also stops the perpetuation of it you know, there are all kinds of questions about like where, where we may or may not get involved and there are individual dimensions to that. And, and so like that there are ways in which this individual practice of taking responsibility for harm we've caused that we remember or understanding that whatever is happening now, no matter what it is, whether we remember why or can trace it back is definitely the result of past action. That's just everything now is conditioned on some previous moment. And so the question is never, oh, well, why is this, you know, what is, is there a reason this is happening? It's never about some abstract reason or like a future reason that it's meant to be. It's always happening because the last thing just happened and the thing before that happened. And so it's like, there's nothing mystical about that. That's like very clear. And we watch that unfolding and, and we develop that as much as we can understanding that it's very hard and there's going to be volatility. And so then we, okay, we have the volatility. Where do we have boundaries with, okay, our rage, our anger, our grief. Do we hold some restraint around where that takes place in terms of language, where that takes place in terms of physical actions so that there are degrees of where we're generating more karma and the places where we're reconciling it and trying to sort of actually take responsibility for our own heart's response to what's happening in the world feel the volatility, feel the fire, feel the voltage, but actually use it and to generate more understanding, more, um, more compassion, you know, more care. And it's really hard. And what are the collective ways of doing that are not always clear, but that this is a, there's, this is a, not just metaphorical of like how we're doing it individually. I can see the difference with how I respond to, say, COVID and the stuff, how I respond to COVID and the suffering it's created. You know, there's compassion for the suffering, but there's not anger. But when I hear about whichever senator it was who swore he would 
not push through a nominations um, before the new president, going back on his word. That's, I can see the aversion that's added to, to the unpleasant of hearing that um, or the distress of hearing that. There's, there's definite aversion that's added. So that's the piece that I yeah. guess want and to work the, with. Uh, the, the aversion, if that's what comes up, then you work with, like, I think that this is kind of why it's such a good time to practice, because if you think you're over, you don't have any more version, <laughs> you don't have any more fear, you're probably getting a little test here, because this is a time where there's more fear arising, there's more anger arising, and like Jesse says, grief, whatever it is, it's like, this is, this doesn't mean, um, that you're not working with the karma well, it means that this is the karma and we need to work with the anger in a well. It's not, it's not that the anger shouldn't appear or the fear shouldn't appear. It's that we get a better relationship with it. I had some guy really scam me so well during the retreat. Like uh, I was vulnerable because of something that was happening with my own Medicare social security. And he had a line that kind of hooked me. And when I realized it was a scam, I really told this guy off. <laughs> I mean, I was just like, you should be so ashamed of yourself. That was a nice thing that I said. <laughs> I mean, I was just like, this is not okay on any level. You know, I don't care how, if you need money, there must be another way than this, you know. But it's like, just like that's just one example of many examples in a day where, of course, we get upset at certain things. This is what Jesse, this is so important, Zoe. It's a misinterpretation to think that the times we're living in isn't going to create a cooking pot where we're going to get to see more of our stuff. That's why it's a good practice time. Don't they have the same, you know, to be blessed to live in difficult times? Or I might have changed it from mm -hmm. inter interesting to difficult. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's like this is a gold mine we're living in in terms of practice not but we don't like it and there's too many people suffering that's why we're so upset of course it's uh, not an easy uh, of course of course we want things to be um, moving in a direction of less suffering of course And I, I do want to say that it's a, it's a longer topic that I won't get into now, but I, I think it's something to be careful about assuming that the, spirit, the, the, the spiritual path and progress and mechanics are directly scalable to society transformation. And, and to just really remember like that the Buddha really wasn't teaching people how to change the world right? He was showing people how to unhook from greed, hatred, and delusion, really much on an individual level, pointing out the social benefits of that, for sure, etc. But like, how do you actually change government policy? How do you do these things? Like, there are places where these tools and approaches aren't designed for that, right? That, that compassion, equanimity are, are not actually designed to to make change in the world outside of us. And so that there's places where you can see where anger, righteous indignation is like a, a useful tool to gather people's energy to confront oppression in the world. And so there's like a carefulness of like, where do you hold society's response to oppression by these standards? And where do you hold them in a different context, in a different light, because they're really working in a different terrain. It's, a, it's an ongoing question for me that I feel like I really wrestle with and struggle with and don't have a clear answer. Um, but I also think that it's, it's just something to be careful of that we don't judge 
the work of social change by these standards around a practice that's actually not designed for that. And so that you don't want people to just be doormats to, you know, equanimous caring doormats to like whatever comes their way in terms of the powers that be. Um, and so just to sort of be careful about where we kind of go and, 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 and not just careful, but engaged and rigorous about how do we think about how these things are related and where do they support one another and where, um, where don't they, you know, so, but that is a whole other pot of rice <laughs> for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah thank you. Oh, uh, good to see everybody. Yeah. Good luck. This is what we all need, the blessing of, you know, cheer, cheering you on, cheering us all on. Hmm. Cooking well. May you cook well this week. <laughs> simmer, a nice simmer. <laughs> Take good care. Thank you, too.